Magandang umaga. Good evening to everyone. Welcome to the Millennium Project launch of uh, the Philippines. And this is in collaboration uh, between the Philippine Features Thinking Society and the Millennium Project. And of course, with special participation of the Development Academy of the Philippines, Graduate School of Public and Development Management, and the Philippine Society for Public Administration. I am Liz and Kalina, your moderator for this morning. And um, I'll be uh, acknowledging all our uh, thought uh, leaders, our experts, and everyone here in Zoom uh, room. And by the way, we are live via Facebook, and later on, we will upload this in our YouTube channel. So this launch marks the 64th Millennium Project Philippines Node, which stands by the long-running program of the Millennium Project. Present here today are experts, thought leaders, state universities and colleges, private organizations, government agencies, and other potential partners. Very well represented, it only means that the idea of building the country's features intelligence system and improving the prospects of shaping a better future are highly regarded. As we begin, may I acknowledge the presence of our honorable guests. We have Dr. Jerome Glenn, co-founder and CEO of uh, Millennium Project. We have Ms. Purish Shwadri, Chairman, Millennium Project Pakistan Node, Dr. Concepcion uh, Oliverietta, Chair, Millennium Project Mexico Node, Dr. Anita Sykes Kelleher, Chair, Millennium Project Australia Node, Senator Pia Cayetano, Senator Senate of the Philippines, Senator Sherwin Gatchalian, Senate, Senate of the Philippines, Senator Sonny Angara, Senate, oh, Senate of the Philippines, His Excellency Ambassador Gerard Ho Wei Hon, Ambassador of Singapore to the Philippines. We also have representatives from the U.S. Embassy. We also have Ms. Yemi Raskwerki, Senior Policy Advisor, UNDP, Dr. Aljun Barilag, Commissioner Ched, Dr. Tirso Ronquillo, President of PASUK, ASEC Angelito De Leon of the Department of National Defense, Honorable Geraldine Roman, District Representative of Bataan House of Representatives, Attorney Arlene Lorejo Kosapi, Vice President for Mindanao, ASPAP. We also have Dr. Stephen Jost, Country Representative 
Conrad Adenoir Stiftung, Mr. Sam Achitek Country Representative of the Asian Foundation, Dr. Maria Luisa Delaico, Academic Person Director, Asian, Asian Institute of uh, Management. We also have from state universities and colleges, Dr. Muhi, President of Polytechnic University of the Philippines, Dr. Philomena um, Diagbil, President of Cebu Normal University, Dr. Angeline Pogoy, Vice President for Research, Cebu Normal University, Dr. Lawrence Garcia, Research Director, Cebu Normal University, Dr. Shirley Agrupis, President Mariano Marcas, uh, State University, Dr. Sakorna Tangol, President Mindanao State University. From various sectors, we have um, a number of uh, representatives from DNR. We have uh, Demetrio Ignacio, EVP of DNR and RDC, uh, Albert Magalang, Head of DNR Climate Change Office, Dean Joel Tantores, Dean of UP v VSP Virata School of Business, Gerald Glenn Panganiban, Assistant Director of the Department of Agriculture. We also have the President and CEO of DOE, PNOC, Renewables Corporation, John Arsenas. And um, we also have from UNDP, uh, Ms. Mariliza Sakra, Communications Associate. And also we have a former DAP President, um, Sir Tony Kalau, and uh, also, one of the members of uh, Futuristic Organization, Dr. Hill Santos. And uh, to our participants, good morning again. And um, I would like to um, introduce now, no, in order for us to commence the uh, program proper, uh, may we call on the Vice President of Philippine Features Thinking Society and also the Chair of the Millennium Project Philippines Node, Professor Sherman Cruz, for his welcome remarks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lizan. Our president, uh, Dr. Lizan is our president of the Philippine Futures Thinking Society and the co chair of uh, the Millennium Project Philippines. Uh, Senator Pia Cayetano, uh, of course, uh, our champion of uh, futures thinking at the Senate and chair of the Senate Committee on SDGs, uh, Innovation and Futures Thinking. Uh, Senator Wynne Gachalian, Senator uh, Sunny Angara, uh, Representative Geraldine Roman, Dr. Alex, uh, Jerome, and uh, uh, Anita, Concepcion, Ruesh, my good friend, uh, there are the MP chairs of Australia, Mexico, and Pakistan, and uh, Mr. Noel de Guia, our treasurer and co-founder of Field Futures, Dr. Reggie Algadan, uh, Sheila Castillo, Celine, uh, uh, and uh, members and colleagues of the Philippine Futures Thinking Society, uh, distinguished partners, uh, guests, and colleagues of the Millennium Project, uh, Field Futures, the Center for Engaged Foresight, the Development Academy of the Philippines, and the Philippine Society for Public Administration, and the Millennium Project Philippine team, and to all of our friends who dreamed with us, who helped us, and who signed up to join and celebrate with us uh, today virtually. Good morning. Thank you so much, and welcome to the future. I take great pleasure and delight in uh, welcoming you all on this uh, significant milestone, and indeed, I would say an important day in the, in the history of futures thinking in the country, uh, the, the launching of the Millennium Project Philippines. Uh, this was once a wish. A dream but now a vivid and a colorful reality today. So uh, you, as you have heard, as you might have seen in the chat, we always greet everyone, Hiraya Maniwari, and uh, it means that uh, may all of your wishes, dreams, and aspiration and preferred future visions come true. So Hiraya Maniwari, a couple of months ago uh, the Hiraya team of uh, Field Futures had an exploratory and I would say a pretty sincere and intimate conversation about why ways by which we as an organization uh, can help the country build an agile collective intelligence network and uh, with a strong futures research and strategic foresight capability. And then uh, I thought that there's no better way to do this and the fact that we felt that we needed to lift frog the lift froggers, uh, meaning the countries and institutions that have been doing futures foresight work for years, you know, uh, and been engaged at the global, national and uh, local level uh, but to email and set up a meeting with Jerry, you know, about the possibility of setting up the Millennium Project in the Philippines. And so on a Monday morning, I emailed Jerry our intention to create the MP Philippines Nod. And uh, Jerry, generous and inspiring as always has been, agreed to meet with us. Uh, Dr. Lizan and I on a Tuesday, 7th of July, 10 p.m. Exactly, that's 10 a.m. for Jerry uh, to meet with us. So uh, after that meeting, it was a brilliant and fantastic meeting. And then... Uh, we got the nod from Jerry, okay, Sherman Lizan, create the Philippine uh, 
Millennium Project of the Philippines, and then uh, we will work out from that. And uh, after that, we set up a meeting with Puruesh and Anita for the insights, uh, ideas, suggestions, and recommendations. And that was it. After those meetings, we regrouped, and the Philippine Futures uh, agreed to host and organize the Millennium Project Philippines. And here we are today, gathered to launch the MP Philippines Node. So the Millennium Project Philippines envisions to build uh, the futures research capacity of the country and uh, develop and publish the Philippine State of the Future Index, or the National SOFI Index to measure the changing state of the country's future. Uh, the aim really is to collaborate with the country's experts, uh, thought leaders, state universities and colleges, civil society, government agencies, and other potential partners who wish to help create the country's futures and long-term intelligence system and to improve our prospects of uh, shaping a better future. And at a planetary level, uh, for the Philippines, for us, you know, to participate in generating and accumulating ideas and wisdom via the Millennium Project Global Futures Intelligence System and the MP Initiative uh, to improve uh, humanity's prospects for a brighter future measured against the 15 Millennium Challenges. As Jerry has said, the Millennium Project is a think tank on behalf of humanity, uh, on behalf of building a better future for all of us. But uh, Jerry will talk more about the MP having 60 plus nods all over the world and the SOFI index and uh, my fellow MP chairs, uh, Puruesh, Anita, and Concepcion sharing their journeys with us uh, during the fireside chat that will be moderated by Dr. Reggie Nald Ugadan, our Secretary General at Field Futures and a fellow uh, at the Millennium Project. So uh, now please introduce me to briefly, uh, yeah, introduce to you uh, Jerry. So uh, Jerome Glenn, or as we love to call him Jerry, is the CEO of uh, the Millennium Project since 1996 and uh, designer of the Global Futures Intelligence System. Uh, he has published over more than 100 future-oriented articles and publications such as the International Tribune, New York Times, uh, Royal Society of Arts Journal, and The Futurist. He has keynoted for more over 200 conferences for leading corporations like Google, uh, governments, and universities uh, around the world. He invented the futures wheel analysis. You know, uh, I, I always use the futures wheel in all of my futures and foresight workshop. You know, uh, it is a tool that I use. Basically, it's really a brilliant tool, simple but powerful, uh, to help us discern the full and long-term impacts of an event, issue, or a policy. Uh, Jerry has helped coordinate the research behind, uh, I think this should be more, uh, 11 or more annual State of the Future Index reports all around the world. Uh, and Jerry has uh, more than 37 years of experience in future research for the U.S. and other governments, international organization, and private industry. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, a mentor, a pioneer, and a founding father of global futures thinking and research, please welcome uh, Dr. Jerome Glenn. Unmute me. There we go. After that introduction, if there's uh, no further questions, that's all I have to say. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. That was a very kind introduction. Uh, I was asked to give a little bit of a, a background on the journey of the Millennium Project. The, 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 the reason for the term millennium is that I was coined uh, by another think tank called the the Futures Group that was created by Ted Gordon, uh, or Theodore Gordon, who is the co-founder of the Millennium Project with me. The original idea was to make a gift from the previous millennium to the next millennium. And it was supposed to be some massive uh, assessment of the future. Uh, and it was written up back in 1988. And at the time, I was the uh, liaison between the United Nations University headquartered in Tokyo and the United States. Uh, and I was also uh, the US's head of the American Council for UN University representative to Tokyo. So it was a two way, <laughs> two way job. And the idea uh, of doing another massive futures research project as our gift from one money to the next, I figured it was not enough. There are tons of future studies programs that you all know that, that 
reports are made and champagne is drunk and, and not much happens. So I thought what it should be is the gift should be a system of our millennium to the next millennium that, that we could build a collective intelligence on the future for all of us together. So we'd give that capability on to the next thousand years. So that's the idea. Uh, and we're still working on it. We've got another thousand years or so to go, almost. <laughs> but the idea of creating a global participatory think tank was pretty ambitious, after all. And um, so the United Nations University said, well, you've got to do a feasibility study. And before you do a feasibility study, you've got to do a pre-feasibility study. In other words, somebody must be thinking about this in the world. And you have to let us know that no one else really is doing it. So yes, we in the UN University can do something about that. So that was a pre-feasibility study. Nobody else was doing it. But the US Environmental Protection Agency said, you know, we have a futures unit and we need some interlocutory, some system to intersect with on a global basis. We got the US, but we don't have anything to, to work with uh, on, a general, on a general future. Uh, UNDP is here, they're doing development. You got World Health, they're doing health. Uh, you know, World Bank's doing the economic development stuff. The IMF's doing the finance. But, but, but who's doing the general future? So the UN University said, okay, do a feasibility study now. And so it was done underneath the UN University, and then we moved it over to the World Economics, World Institute of Development Economics Research, which is a part of UN University in Helsinki. And then we decided to have the freedom and flexibility. Uh, it was, should be underneath an NGO, which was the American Council for UN University. So it started. 1996 under the American Council for UN University, although it was under officially uh, the UN University during the feasibility, three-year feasibility study. So then we began with a blank slate of paper, sending out, because we'd had three years of developing ideas and people and so forth. So we started off with the question, what's going on that's gonna become a big deal in 25 years that is either misunderstood or sort of not understood at all, not aware of people. So we collected, I think it was something like, I don't know, 100, 200 developments. We went through a long, torturous process of interviewing people and more questionnaires, and that's what produced the 15 global challenges. And we update and try to improve insights into these 15 global challenges ever since then. Um, and we think it's a good framework understanding global change. You know, like the human body, we have a framework. We don't understand all of the human body, but we have the respiratory system and the skeletal system and the nervous system, you know, and, and all of that. And we know basically how it all works together, essentially. So we have a framework for understanding our body, but we don't have the framework for understanding the body of civilization of, of us all together. So the, so the 15 global challenges is one way of sort of wrapping your mind around the global change and moving forward. So that's how the 15 challenges got created and how we got, got created. Um, now, Sherman also asked me to mention a few words about the uh, State of the Future Index. We began the State of the Future Index in 1990. Uh, the idea was, how, people always ask future, well, how are we doing, you know? <laughs> how are we doing? Uh, you know, it's getting worse, getting better, you know, what's going on? Well. The answer, of course, is, well, it depends what you mean by the future, and it depends what, what areas. So the idea was to say, okay, here we got these 15 global challenges, right? If we were making progress on all of these things, what would you measure? So then we put a bunch of indicators together, and we take 20 years of longitudinal data on each of those indicators, about 30 indicators or so, and we then project out 10 years, so that gives us 30 years. We then send out a questionnaire to people around the world and say, okay, how could this variable be best possible in 10 years? And what's the worst possible? So imagine that you've got 20 years of data, you've got a trend projection of 10 years, and then you get what's the best possible, what's the worst possible? So then you can look at it and say, well, how much to the good are we? So then you can put all these variables together into an index, how much are we to the good? 
as a whole system. Then when you do that, you can lean back and say, okay, if the first variable is actually achieved, how would that change the final number 10 years out? And you do that for each one. So we call a sensitivity analysis. So to find out how powerful each variable is relative to the other variables to improve the whole future. Some things will be, are improving along and it doesn't need a whole lot of help. Some things are not improving a whole lot and it needs help because we want to have a whole future better, not just an economic future, not just an education future. We want a whole future together. So that's the idea of the state of the future index. Some reflections on what the node might do. One, of course, is that and you have uh, uh, Prue here who can tell you about her recent experience with, with Pakistan on that. Uh, another possibility is that you could take the 15 global challenges. Um, Conception is doing this in Mexico and for Latin America, saying what would those 15 global challenges be like in Mexico? How are we doing on water? How are we doing on energy? And so we go all through that. So they're, they're, they're putting a book together of all 15 challenges, but for Mexico. I think uh, Australia, I think you also did another a version of that as well. So that's another possibility that you can, uh, you can consider. A, th a third one um, is we just finished a, a book called the State of uh, called the World, what is it called? Work in Technology 2050, Scenarios and Actions. And part of that, of the actions part, was workshops done around the world after reading the three scenarios in the future of work and technology. And that's just to get people warmed up and then you can throw the scenarios out. And have a workshop. What does this mean for my country? So we collected all of these things together. So the, so the Philippines could do, do, do a workshop on that as well. Then I would suggest um, that you, you, you're you already engaged in some of the university systems here, but you, the, the future research methodology is, is, is the largest collection of methods so far. And this is a good resource for universities to have. Or the, 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 the teaching any futures course or research or looking at global, global change, those methods can help. Also, the state of the future itself is good, good text that some universities use around the world. When they're looking at uh, the global strategic landscape in business, uh, or they're looking at public policy sort of stuff. And then the libraries and universities can, can get a hold of the Global Futures Intelligence System, which is an online system that puts all this stuff together. It's like the collective intelligence system. It, if it survives, you never know, but if it survives, that could be the gift to the next generation. How do you put together the thinking of the world? We don't have complete agreement on everything. So you'll see in the index, or in, this, in the collective intelligence system, something like cap and trade, advantages, disadvantages, um, price on carbon, advantages, disadvantages. So you'll see different, the idea is to pull it all together. The, the thought is if we can put all of the good thinking of humanity together on a table in some organized way, then we can lean back and say, okay, what do we think? What's going on? Where do we, what do we got to do as a, as a species? So that's the idea of the Millennium Project and the nodes are to connect the local thinking of a country and the global thinking. That's the idea, it's the global local. And so um, bless you for taking on the responsibilities for the Philippines on this. And I wish you a wonderful future and we're at your service and very quickly, last comment, every node can be in charge of the whole Millennium Project for what they want. Conception can tell you that she said, I wanna have an encyclopedia uh, or dictionary encyclopedia of the terminology so we can have a common understanding. And she just took it on. And, and the, so the nodes around the world helped her. Other people have initiated other activities and others can help it. So that you may not only do stuff for your country internally with this, you can also say, what would you like the rest of the Millennium Project to work with you for your country as well. I thank you and good luck and happy future. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Glenn, for inspiring us on how are we going to continue our Millennium Project uh, Philippine Node. No? And also, as you mentioned, it's uh, really about putting all the good things together for the sake of the humanity. So this is really about our intergenerational responsibility and uh, for us to go forward for a future that cares. So at this point in time, I'd like to acknowledge also some of our 
colleagues and friends. We are also joined by Dr. Marcus Blasi from uh, the University of Sunshine Coast. Uh, Dean uh, Sai uh, uh, Bagulong of Cotabato State University, so they are from Mindanao. And then Dean Maria Luisa Delaico of Asian Institute Management. We also have uh, Dr. Ferdi Lamarca from the University of Northern Philippines, so that's the northern part. And also from the University of Makati CCAPS, represented by Professor Sonia Pimentel. We also have Dr. Nedi Toralba, President of Pamantasan ng Lungsod ng Valenzuela. We also have Dr. Shirley Agrupis, President of Mariano Marcos State University, also um, from the northern part of the of the Philippines, and also another from the northern part, Dr. Marvin Munar of um, Ilocos Training Medical Center from the health sector, and of course, the president of International City County Management Association, uh, DAP GSPDM uh, Philippine Chapter. We have Professor Mitch Ville Rivera, so he is the president of ICMA. So now uh, let's proceed to the sharing of country experiences, and this will be uh, moderated by uh, Dr. Reggie Ogadan. Dr. Reggie? Yes, thank you very much, Dean. Um, once again, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being with us in the launching of the Millennium Project Philippines Node. Um, since this is the Philippines MPs inauguration day, uh, we also invited some of the leading and current nodes of the, Philippine, of, of the Millennium Project to share with us their country's experiences, their journey. Maybe we, we can also hear some of their initiatives, programs, activities, maybe as well as challenges in sustaining all their gains in improving humanity's prospects for building a better future. We have with us um, Dr. Puresh Choudhary of the Pakistan. And also we have with us um, Dr. Concepcion Alavarieta of the Mexico Node. Also, we have Dr. Anita sykes Kelleher of the Australia, Australasian Node. And also one of the very supportive global advisory board of the, the Philippine Futures Thinking Society. And of course, um, Dr. Jerome Glenn, the co-founder and CEO of the Millennium, Millennium Project. Okay. So, um, after the sharing, uh, I would like also to encourage everyone to ask questions to our distinguished resource person. You may key in your questions in our chat box. Um, may I also invite the chair and co-chair of Chairman and Dean Lizan of the Philippines MP Node and the Philippine Futures Thinking Society, uh, the members of this Philippine Society, think, Futures Thinking Society to ask questions. Okay. So I think we are all set now. So, um, Let's start first with the, maybe we can hear, you know, what are the experiences and journey of the MP node. Maybe we can start with Pakistan through Dr. Perez, then it will be followed by Mexico through Dr. Concepcion, and then Australasia through Dr. Anita. Um, Dr. Perez, please. Uh, hi, uh, everyone. It's fairly early uh, in Pakistan, Islamabad. Um, so I started actually, um, I started the foresight journey back in 2000 and um, uh, so to say 2012. I launched Pakistan Node as a as a as a formal uh, uh, step in 2015. I guess if I'm not if I'm not getting the years mixed up um, in Pakistan, a, a foresight thinking is not really embedded in uh, uh, the institutions. Um, they have uh, what we call, uh, we're very, very, very strong when it comes to strategic studies, but we don't have a program that has uh, a component which is, which is entirely focusing on uh, futures thinking. So um, we developed a lot of ministries around the information and communication technologies and um, uh, uh, some uh, select committees on SDGs, but um, Never have I come across uh, any institutional effort to actually formally uh, adapt uh, strategic foresight or foresight thinking at the public policy level. Anyways, um, coming back to uh, uh, what we did in Pakistan with the help of uh, Jerry and uh, uh, Theodore um, J. Gordon, 
was to how do we introduce a state of future index, uh, taking into consideration some of the important variables that were important to and that still are important to Pakistan into consideration before actually knowing where the country is. So for us, foresight was more of a journey to moving closer to what the possible truth is rather than actually uh, using it to uh, influence any level of uh, public policy. Um, nevertheless, um, initially we uh, took inspiration for the from the countries that had already done State of Future Index and we wanted to deploy um, whatever their experiences and learning were throughout. Uh, one of the key things that I had initially developed was to actually work with the universities and think tanks in the country. So we have a partnership of almost uh, uh, 40 different universities in Pakistan and with almost five to six think tanks. So that was basically how we wanted to carry out the State of Future Index study. Um, it, 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 it was the sort of a scope that really helped us uh, rein in a lot more participation from the academic and uh, research point, point of view. So the skeleton work, um, like Jerry was saying about the anatomy, we understand the framework of uh, how the human body functions. Um, so we generated a, a, a basic skeleton and the foundation through which we can conduct these studies. Um, so in 2017, we launched the first Pakistan State of Future Index. We included almost uh, 30 variables. In 2019, um, with the help of uh, Ted and Jerry both, we were able to launch the trend impact analysis report where we figured in 50 of the most pressing developments. Um, it's so fascinating because if I look back, we did actually uh, sort of mention very naively though, but we did sort of mention a possible epidemic or pandemic having an effect on those 30 variables. But in 2019, we added another two variables uh, into Pakistan's state of future index, taking us from 30 that we did in 2017 all the way up to 32. Uh, the reason for being so ambitious uh, in our approach was that we need we needed to create the foundation through which we can have influence any level of uh, public policy. And we deliberately kept it away in the public space rather than having uh, the government to carry this forward to be as uh, as impartial as possible. So um, I think we are at a stage where there is a lot more conversation around foresight uh, in the country and futures thinking in the last three years. Um, but we have yet to gravitate towards how the bureaucracy will uh, start to use it. So we are pushing for, um, at, at, at a very civil society level, we are pushing for the government to sort of have an uh, anticipatory governance approach in order to make decisions or to uh, understand what is the arc between the responsibility and accountability. So, so far, I mean, uh, this is where we are and we continue to uh, improve our understanding of the foresight methods and uh, techniques. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Purvas. Uh, maybe if you have questions later on, uh, you can reserve it. Let, let's hear first, um, Dr. Concepcion from Mexico. Well, I'm very happy to be with all of you. We are really far away. Um, I met Jerry in 2003 at the World Future Society conference, annual conference. And I was really impressed because he spoke about the 50 global challenges. Like um, six months late, later, he came to Mexico City as a keynote speaker to a big uh, uh, foresight event that we have in Mexico. And then we had a chance to, to speak a little bit more about how to integrate the, the Mexican note. Uh, uh, he invited me to Brazil. And I, and I found out there that the, there were people very, very interesting. And they were speaking uh, in, uh, with some words that it was not so easy for me to understand them. So um, the, the, the president, the chair of the Iran note, said that we should uh, have a, a glossary. And that's the reason how I started with the idea of developing uh, not just a glossary, but uh, a World Foresight Picture Encyclopedia. 
that it took me uh, like with, with Jerry and Ted Gordon, maybe like, like 12 years. We, we finished it, it has more than 1,000 words and methodologies in a very simple way so the, the, the people that are not um, really uh, very much involved in POSA, they can really uh, very, very fast check what does that word mean. Later on, uh, Jerry came to Mexico and at the same time I found out that they were not working with uh, uh, the Millennium Project and no one working with, with children and, uh, and teachers directly the way uh, uh, in regard to the 50 global challenges. So um, there, was, there was a dinner at my place with some people and they, they, they started speaking about the possibility of organizing a prize. So that's the way we started with the, with, uh, with, um, a, the prize award for, for people, for young people, at the, they were like, like 11, 12 years old like a pilot project. And then it was very successful, very well uh, received by the government. And, but when Jerry came here to the, to the uh, award ceremony, he said, this should go to all the, the young people in the world. And then we thought, how are we going to do this? And the way we did it is through internet. We, we ran that project for almost five years with uh, sometimes the, the, with the support of the, of the government. And we had winners uh, from all over the world. They came here to the award ceremony in Mexico. And it, it was very interesting how, how they really empowered when they, when they were at the award ceremony uh, mentioning uh, which, which was uh, their main proposal for, for changing that challenge that they had chosen. It was a very nice experience. Then the political situation changed and it was not easy to go ahead with, uh, with the, without uh, that, that program. But it, it, it is something that you should also try in Philippines. I, I think it's a very, very good project. The other, the other, the, the other reason I, that I, that I, that I uh, was really serious involved in the 15 Global Challenges is because uh, um, in Mexico, there, 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 are, there are different futurists uh, that are working uh, and competing amongst themselves. But they are not, they don't have this holistic vision of working in, uh, in, in the future of Mexico. So that's the way we invited expert, Mexican experts to write down on the 15 level challenges and uh, Mexico towards 2050 15 level challenges, that's the name. And uh, the reason is to 2050, because we need several generations to implement those ideas that we are, we are we're proposing at the end of this um, Mexico 2050. And so each author writes uh, the challenge, just, but they, they really don't, don't uh, prepare a scenario. Because of this holistic impact, the scenario, we had to wait and, 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 and have all, all the, the, the essays finished by the, by the authors and to, to write the scenarios. So we had the three scenarios. And after that, we said, well, this is not enough. We have to give them a little bit more. And then we decided to have like, like um, rector uh, uh, projects ideas. So they so that they can start on thinking on which challenge they what are the things that they, they can start doing with them, and so this has been we are almost closing now that, that that book, and it should be launched at the end of this year or early next year, and after that uh, we thought that there's a network the the Ver American uh, uh, network. And, and uh, a friend of mine, uh, which is a PhD from a very important university, and I were together speaking about what to do with this river. That's the name of this network. And, uh, and we decided that we should do the same, but at the level of the region. So uh, then we invited uh, the, the chairs to participate in writing the same, uh, to choose a challenge, and, and write an essay on them, and we will do just exactly the same things 
that we had with this, this very good experience with, with Mexico. And it's a very well, it, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting way of communicating because we are not replicating what, what Jerry has done with the 50 Global Challenges. We are finding out which are the paths that we have to follow. For example, I have chosen to, in, 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 for the two books, the transnational organized crime message. Hmm? What is the future for the transnational organized crime? And I think in this prevention, but it has to be a, a, a different kind of approach when we speak about prevention. We have to, to, to create like an eco, a social prevention ecosystem. So all the people really get involved and they commit to, to, to face the problem that in all the world we are, we are, we are living. You know? And um, in general, we are always, in, in, in regard to, to Mexico City, we give many lectures, we're involved with universities and, and uh, special associations with the World Future Society as well, and uh, other, other futurist, futurist groups. And uh, there, when we started, something that was very interesting, we invited an expert, an expert, uh, uh, that, that is, was very well recognized in our country uh, on, on one of the challenges. And this was a very good way to start because we had to feed back the Millennium Project what, on what was going in general in, uh, of a new situation in our country. And so we created a group, a very specialized group, a committed group. And we are still very, very close to each other. So when we have the, these, uh, um, it, all, all these real-time Delphi that, that Jerry organizes. It is very easy to invite people and uh, to involve them in all the new things that we are doing. So in general, I can tell you that we have our arms open to welcome you and give all our knowledge that we have learned since uh, almost 16 years being at the Millennium Project, which has been a great experience, a, break, a breakthrough, I can say, in my life. Well, oh, thank you very much, um, Dr. Conception, and for, for that sharing. Um, again, uh, please reserve your questions um, to Dr. Pruess and Dr. Um, Conception. Um, let's hear it first from um, Australasia, um, Dr. Anita. Hi, good morning, everybody. Hi, good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you again. And Reggie, can I just say, I love the photographs of your daughter's first birthday. She is so cute. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you so very thank much. You thank you for, for the greetings. And, and there's something we have in common is that family orientation that drives our futures work. Um, for me, that was why I started studying future studies back 20 years ago now at university. Um, I, my daughter had got married. They were intending to have a family fairly soon. And I started thinking about what kind of world are we bringing our grandchildren into? And, and I thought, what can I do about that? So um, I found this course called Future Studies. I started studying it. I thought, this is something I can engage with. And during my master's degree in Future Studies, I stumbled across a lot of different organizations. The Millennium Project was one of those. And I decided as a student of Future Studies, this was a really good resource to access um, information from different countries around the world. And if you want to create a better world for your grandchildren, accessing information on what the rest of the world thinks is, is I think, quite crucial. Um, and I, I found then as I moved from being a student at university to a teacher of university, it was also a great resource to provide students with um, a meaningful outlet for their student research. Uh, coming from the corporate background as I did and moving into academia for the first time in my life in my 40s, I found academic research quite challenging and people kept saying, you've got to get published. I thought, how do you do that as a student? And for me as a student and as a lecturer, being able to develop projects around the 15 global challenges to set student assignments around them, and then to be able to share them with the Millennium Project 
so that they could actually be used and their work acknowledged in a global publication was, was a, a significant benefit. And one of the key reasons why I, I gave Lizanne and Sherman a bit of a nudge and said, look, when are you guys going to join? <laughs> because I see with all the programs that you're talking about in the Philippines, the certificates, the masters, maybe even a doctorate at some future stage, um, having these kind of resources at your disposal with methodologies and, and research from around the world will be really helpful to you. Um, during my time as, ooh, sorry, let me just scroll out. During my time and involved in this um, project, Jerry briefly mentioned earlier about um, an Australian book and it, it actually became a, a special edition, I think, of the Journal of Future Studies. Um, that was about nine or ten years ago, I think, Jerry. So it's probably time we did an update. And then Concepcion suggested, why don't you do something? Because I was talking about the regional collaboration in Asia of the Asian nodes. And how do we get a, a project that everyone can contribute to without, you know, having to get lots and lots of investment and so on. And Concepcion said they were doing this um, regional approach, essays and so on. I thought that's a great idea. So um, I'm going to copy that idea, Concepcion. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> But I think it's just a good way that people can come together very quickly, very easily, as I said, without a lot of funding to produce a publication that can go out internationally. So, um, yeah, and I'm delighted that Purush and I, uh, Purush has agreed to collaborate and that we'll be working on together on taking the Asian collaborative, however we want to style it, um, together. Um, Initially, we started the Asian or Regional Collective back in 2010. Jerry, Vancouver, was that 2010 or 2011? Uh, one year or the other, who cares? Yeah, Somewhere exactly. around. <laughs> it was a long time ago anyway. Um, and what was really interesting, we heard from the European collaboration, we heard from the South American collaboration. I thought, Look at Asia. I mean, this is the world's growth center. And why don't we have an Asian collaboration? So the leads of the um, Asian nodes, we all sat down and said, well, let's do something. And uh, we had a very ambitious project to start with. It was great working together. The project didn't deliver everything we expected. And again, that was lack of development funding and so on. But um, the relationships were cemented. And for me, that was a really important uh, step forward for us. Um, there's always some kind of major project underway. I think Jerry's already presented on the COVID-19 studies that are currently underway and the yeah, work technology that, yes. studies. Yeah. And the work technology studies that were recently completed and that are available. And looking back through history, I think my first one was the scenarios for peace between Israel and Palestine. And that was for me as a student of future studies, looking for a meaningful outlet that I was happy to contribute my personal time to. That was, it was a small contribution for me, but it meant a lot. Um, we've moved on from doing a lot of academic research. Um, we have had partnerships that have come and gone, and that's fine. I think that's the nature of relationships. When money's not involved, people come and they go and they contribute what they can and when they can. But this year was a, a little break from our usual departure of universities and research institutes. And this year we partnered with an organization in Perth called the PVI Collective, which is a tactical media performance art organization and we co-created a game for participatory futures around the 15 global challenges and people's fears for the future. It lasted a few months and it had citizens, governments and businesses involved in design studio ideation, street performances, um, artistic expression. It was just really exciting and interesting. And it really engaged with younger people in our city, which was my aim really. Um, and actually, I was thinking about this because having visited the Philippines and seen some of the culture and experienced some of the cultural expression, the dance in particular, all the variations of dance right from the early historical forms to right up to date, what I call the doof doof music. Um, but the cultural expression in the Philippines is very strong. And I'm wondering whether there's an opportunity here to introduce the Philippines node to the PVI Collective and see if there's any mutual collaboration. Um, but I think 
just sort of winding up, the MP continues to offer opportunities to students to gain research experience, which I see, again, as I said, as a valuable contribution to DAP GSPDM as the proposed futures thinking and strategic foresight courses are launched in the near future. And I see the Philippines node as contributing a unique cultural ex uh, perspective to Millennium Project research with their very distinctive influences from East and West and seeming equally at home in both. So I'm looking forward to collaborating and I would like to offer my very best wishes to all the people uh, joining this launch today and the future of the Philippines node. It'll be great fun working together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anita. Now let's, let's open the, the floor for questions um, to our resource persons. Um, but maybe I'll just go first. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm really interested of, you know, because Philippines, the, the Philippine node here of the MP is, it's, of course, it's new, right? And um, we would like to know more on the partnerships or collaborations that you've done before or maybe on, on how you sustained your, your works, your MP, I mean, the, the MP works in your, in your country. What are those particular partnerships or how did you come up with those kinds of partnerships and collaborations with maybe with individuals or institutions in your country. Maybe we can start with Pruesh, Lynn, and, and then Dr. Yeah. Conception and, and Anita. Uh, thanks, Reggie. Um, so I think one of the uh, essential learning point for myself when I started my, uh, started working for myself, actually, this is almost, uh, 10 years, 10, 11 years ago, um, was basically understanding how uh, the development sector, because I was coming from a very uh, high-end corporate background. Um, mm -hmm. So I wanted to understand how the development sector works, how policies get made uh, in a country and who are the best resources to approach. So very mm -hmm. early on, I started engaging with universities. Um, mm -hmm whether it meant that I needed to uh, create um, an alternative narrative or whether I need to uh, work on creating counter narratives on extremism and terrorism uh, with, with the academia, it was much more, um, although sometimes it used to bog me down, but with the academia, I think it was an easier access uh, to a lot of professors who were willing to contribute or who had already done work. The other uh, option was to actually work closely with media. And we've been very blessed in the sense like, um, mm -hmm. if you just look at from when we launched the State of Future Index um, on Pakistan, we've got nationwide coverage, although the event took place in, in one mm -hmm. particular area, but it got uh, wide coverage up from north all the way down to south. Uh, so that was a huge uh, um, sort of a, a huge boost to our morale to sort of understand that, okay, there is an appetite uh, mm -hmm. of, for futures thinking with the media, with the academia, and also the think tanks. So the think tanks came in uh, quite quickly to work with us also, be it the left-centered or the right, or even the centrist uh, uh, ones. So uh, developing those partnerships, but then the key question uh, arises, how do you keep them engaged? Yeah. So uh, some partnerships fall out, some partnerships sort of continue. The, the way we have done it is, um, for instance, I'll give you an idea. Uh, we're working on this, uh, um, and this, this is, this is uh, funded by um, the Saudi uh, a university in Saudi Arabia. Uh, we're working on uh, the potential for, of artificial intelligence and human intellect. So we're pretty much uh, doing this research work and sort of developing our own understanding of how it's done. When I, was, when I started with this research proposal, I uh, quickly understood from the fact that this is something new that we're venturing into. So I took the Institute of Space Technology, which is one of the university uh, um, that has been on board ever since we started working on Foresight. So we have their AI department involved. And we also have philosophers involved from one of the institute in Lahore. So, so it's a, a, a mixture of that and a, a, a Lahore University of Management Sciences. So it's a mix of think tanks and academia that is actually coming together in terms of producing more relevant research work. So I think 
Although I started off uh, focusing on uh, counter narratives uh, on extremism and terrorism, we've come such a long way that you have to continuously keep the same people involved in the whole process. And that goes to, um, and I think I'm, I'm really grateful because these people have actually helped us come as far as we've actually come. Oh, thank you very much, um, Pruess. Can, can I ask, I, I think you started with the project on, on the, the, the Pakistan Sophie, right? I, I, was it the first project or the first um, program that you initiated in, in Pakistan and you engaged with universities and the media on this particular program? No, um, actually, um, a lot of the work that we've been doing uh, for the last 10 years, um, we've always had the academia and media uh, involved right from the beginning. I think one essential uh, partner that had come on board were the think tanks. So something we didn't do, uh, say, back in 2010, we started doing now, uh, was actually engaging the think tanks. Uh, I think by engaging the think tanks, we have been able to influence a lot of their research work in terms of understanding the methodology. So for instance, if we were to, the trend impact analysis, all the developments, most of the developments actually came from the think tanks and not the universities. So you've got to balance how you engage different partners, but in a manner that is uh, most essential to them. So uh, I, it's difficult to actually have like the entire 40 different universities and six think tanks engaged continuously, but uh, using different approaches, I think that always helps. Maybe just last question for me, um, Professor, in your case, you know, the, the MP, I mean, um, it's all about that we are a think tank on behalf of the humanity. I think it's, it's, it's like that and not on behalf of the government. Um, in, in the outset, did you engage with the government on all the projects and activities of the no, uh, uh, yeah this is, so this is not to say that the government hasn't been involved we uh, had to separate uh, we had to establish a platform so you know it's so exciting when you hear that uh, millennium project is uh, is a think tank on behalf of the humanity how many think tanks do we come across that are able to say that none in my opinion and mm -hmm. and and so this gives us a very unique perspective uh, of how are we supposed to uh, behave like a global uh, civilization rather than just a civilization from a particular segment of the society. So um, it, it changes your perspective. It helps you understand better of um, where things are moving and what better resource than to actually be on a platform that gives you that access. What uh, Anita just said, that access is very important. And if you are able to share that access with your stakeholders, I mean, that just uh, um, is a multiplier effect. Coming to the question which, you, uh, which you've asked, so we created, a, um, back in 2015, we created Foresight Lab. Yeah, as I think there's a problem no. with the uh, connection, okay. Okay, do you want me to turn off the video? I think it's fine. It's all right. Okay. okay. So uh, your question about like how government got engaged, I'll give you one very brief example. So we have like multiple political parties. Rather than working directly with the government, what we did do is uh, right from the beginning, we had uh, politicians from different political parties participate in the process. So uh, we've had someone from jamaat e islami we've had someone from a People's Party, we had someone from MQM, and these are political parties, and uh, PBP, PTI. What it did do for us is that uh, uh, till this date, we have a spectrum of different political parties participating in the process. So they don't question, they, they've never questioned the process in itself, but they've understood the uh, importance of it. So we've been very lucky enough to actually be, um, have a footprint in the National Assembly of Pakistan, have a footprint in the Senate uh, of the country and also the provincial assemblies. So I think rather than working directly, if you, if you engage political parties, that, that goes a very long way. And we've been lucky. Thank you very much for us for that. Uh, I mean, no, it's very enlightening for, for our part. Um, thank you very much. Um, next, can, can I ask also for Dr. Conception? I think the, the sharing a while ago, it's all about um, you know, the, the perspective of Mexico on the 
the global challenges, right? I think we would like also to know, you know, what kind of partnership or how did you create some collaborations or maybe um, or how you did you bring all those um, different different institutions or groups in that particular um, project or program of the Mexico Node? Well, uh, uh, our our approach in regard to the to 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 inviting the people originally to participate is because when we came back from the from our Millennium Project meeting. I invited all the experts that were my friends to come here. I've been a consultant for us for a long, long time. And we organized like a big cocktail tea at home. And I, I, I also went to Washington and I asked Jerry, which are the most important books that I should have in my library? And I bought them all and I brought them here. And then uh, uh, at the same time that they were involved in the 15 Global Challenges, I, I told them to take a book write down which were the words that they considered that were important to go to the world for science fiction and encyclopedia and then to bring it back to me okay so that's the way we started and the experience was absolutely fantastic because we had like uh, like four thousand words and maps that they have chosen and uh, when Jer jerry saw them he said okay. Mm -hmm. for, for a futures, for a futures uh, dictionary encyclopedia, you, you might only consider around uh, 400 of them. Mm -hmm. Because the other ones should go to a normal dictionary. So uh, what we did then, uh, he, he suggested me to ask the notes and to ask the futurist. And, and he said, if you have a word, if you have a method, you would like to, to share it with us? And then we got it like in two weeks, like 1,000. And then once again, came Jerry and said, well, from all of these, we're just going to keep 600. That's the way we started. For funding, this project had been very, very difficult. So we decided just to do the project and then uh, uh, to give it to the Millennium Project. And then the Millennium Project sells, sells it and uh, because we did we couldn't really find a, a, a good sponsor for it and uh, in regard to the global million price i would like also to share you how was our experience because that's a different product uh, we had we had uh, some sponsorships from the private sector and um, what we received from the government was pretty much a support for distributing and letting the people know that they, this was a contest that was coming in and how should they participate on it. And we started only with, with people from first elementary school and then the Global Millennium Prize went into secondary school, high school and, and university. But we found out that the, 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 the students were, were uh, re learning very, very fast. And uh, the problem was with the teachers now, because the teachers didn't know about the fifteen level challenges. So we had we had like three levels: in the Global Millennium Prize, and the fourth one was for the teachers. And and that's the way we, we organized it. We we had sponsors from like Hewlett Packard was one of them, if I remember, and then different different uh, Nestle. Well, I'm, I'm speaking about the, the big ones. They, they, they were involved. And uh, we had uh, people from local people, we could say in Mexico, in Mexico City that, that sponsor us. It was not um, uh, um, something that could really support the Millennium Project. We were very much volunteers participating on it, but it helped for getting the awards and for paying some stuff. And, um, for them, um, uh, what else would you like me to, would, would, do you want me to ask, to, to, to tell could, you, yes? Could I, could I add on to that? Yes, please, yes, please, Tom, Jerry. Okay, I'll, let me tell you something that happened in that first award ceremony. Uh, these were the middle school, it was just Mexico. A piece of magic happened. You would see uh, a student, 
coming in with their parents and the guy's got nice cufflinks and the most expensive camera you've ever seen in your life. And right next to him is somebody, uh, some parents who've never been to Mexico City ever before and they're very poor people, but their child won one prize and the rich people won one, but they were sitting together. It was so beautiful. And the minister, I think minister of education was there, right? And like, we were all like with the tears coming down. It was so beautiful to see. It was like knocking out all the social stuff. It was like, how can the children help the future better? And it was a common thing. It had nothing to do with rich or poor. It was just very nicely, nicely done. And well, we got like uh, 7 million kids from all over the world from 130 countries, people interested in the Global Millennium Prize as well. So it is a gorgeous project and thanks Jerry for giving us this great support for, for really uh, launching this, this, this project. Hmm? Maybe, maybe some rich Filipino will fund the Global Prize, who knows? But it's still a very good thing it's, it's hard to ask people on their own dime to fly across to Mexico or whatever. Uh, of course, if we stay with this COVID disease long enough, they won't have to do that anymore. Um, but it's a very good idea. Uh, and and I, I've, I run into former winners all the time who have done, gone on, it's, it's helped their whole careers. Uh, but we really should get a, a good sponsor. I mean, someone like Coca-Cola, big sort of sponsor like that to really make it, make it nice. Uh, yeah, I, anyway, yeah. end of the commercial. <laughs> My experience with the, with the sponsors now is that they, they are really more involved in, a, in the market approach now. Mm -hmm. And um, even, even a slay. They say, we, we, we want huge events with many people to get close to them. So if you have, a, it's like, like, like having an expert in fundraising that has this special sensibility in what was, on what is going on in the market now. And uh, uh, we, are, we are now uh, touching different doors for the book, but most of the, of the, of the work from, from the chairs and the Mexican experts have been a volunteer work. And we're looking forward to, to, to have them funded. The situation in Mexico now is very, politically speaking, very, very difficult. Our economy is going down, but anyhow, the people, the Latin American people are, are like uh, very, very happy people inside themselves. And so if they really have a great hope that the things are going to change. So we have to work together and do the things. So that's the good part that we're living now. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Conception. And of course, Jerry, for that sharing. I, I think one common thing that I've seen um, on the case of Pakistan and and Mexico is the, I mean, the engagement with the academy. Um, I, I would like also to hear it from the perspective of Australasia through Dr. Anita about, you know, the, you've mentioned about the, the academic research a, a while ago. I think um, you, you've mentioned something about that. How, how could we, how could we explore this as maybe um, or to, to have partnership or collaboration with, with universities in advancing the, the, the vision or maybe the, the strategies of, of MP here in the Philippines. So. Um, I'd like to quickly acknowledge Dr. Stephanie Pride, who's joined our meeting today. Uh, she's oh, thank you very much. Our, our New Zealand representative for our node. Australasia is actually Australia, New Zealand, Fiji, Papua New Guinea, and a whole list of islands. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you, Stephanie, for making time to join us this morning. Um, so how can we partner with uh, universities and academia generally to further the Philippines node? Is that it? Yeah, yes. Okay. Um, I, I go back to what I said earlier. We have students and lecturers at university, basically, research teams and teaching teams. And I think that universities generally will find partnership with the Philippines universities beneficial and with DAP GSPDM 
beneficial because you'll be able to explore collaborative research, which from a university point of view is always a desirable thing to be able to do if you can partner with international partners. Um, funding is always an issue, but it's always an issue with wherever your university is. I don't think I've ever worked for a university anywhere um, that says, oh, we've got loads of money to spend. It's usually, you know, quite a, quite a long journey to partner, to design, to get the funding support that you need. But um, people are increasingly interested in international research. So uh, start with the universities that you have and build the capability. I know there are pockets, small pockets of it in Philippine uh, education institutes. Um, but those pockets now need to come together. And what the 15 Global Challenges does, I think, could be used for you. Um, if you look on the MP website, you'll see what looks like a ball of string. And it's the 15 global challenges and it shows it's black and white. I think Jerry, isn't it? It shows all the 15 challenges, but how they are all connected to one another. So they are interdependent challenges. And again, I think that's another opportunity for you to take this systemic approach and get your university skilled up, get their networks built up and contact universities elsewhere in the world. They're always happy to hear from Asia, particularly um, countries like the Philippines where English is not a barrier to collaborating in academic research. So I would say um, be strategic about it though. Don't do a scattered gun approach. Um, pick your university partners carefully initially and be very open with them about what you want to achieve from a partnership. And as the Philippine universities are very keen to build their capability from where it is to where they'd like it to be, um, I think people would be very flattered for, for, to get an approach from you that says we would like to learn from you. And we're happy to share with you the experience of some of these challenges in Asia and what other people in this region are doing to resolve them. Um, in terms of the partnerships that we've had in, in Australasia, it's been a very mixed bag. And, and you raise the issue, Reggie, about government partnerships. Um, I went straight in, in, in my very bright-eyed, bushy-tailed early years with the Millennium Project. Yes, we'll go to the national government and they will welcome us with open arms. Um, and one or two of the ministers did. Uh, and I was, I was... I think that's it then, you know, we, we'll be in there now, we'll have something like um, Finland has a committee for the future and ministers for the future. But of course, there's the election cycle and what one minister thinks is brilliant, the next minister who takes that role usually shuts it down. So if you're in a democratic elected government, um, I, don't, I won't say don't partner with government, involve them if, where you can, but pick your ministries. And what I found very successful both for my personal professional practice is to look at the next level down, next level or two down, people who want to learn, who want to grow, but are going to be in the government for years ahead. So you're not looking at people who are going to be kicked out at the next election. Um, yeah, so apart from that, be strategic, look for partnerships where both partners can achieve an aim that they're both seeking to achieve. And that might only be one area. It might be, for example, one of the most rewarding areas for me personally and professionally has been water futures. It's such an issue in Asia and talking to people about the future of water, water shortages potentially, how we get water and with a growing population, the trade-offs, how the Middle East desert states use water and how we waste it in, in some of our uh, more developed countries. The whole thing was quite fascinating. So it might be that you pick a university specialty division that has an interest in whether it's water or health or education, whatever it is, but pick a specialty and then talk to them about their specialty and your shared research interest. So it's like any other kind of relationship. You have to start by looking at each other across the room and making eyes at each other and then holding hands and you know, getting to know each other really well. Okay, thank you very much, Anita. I, I think I got one question in the chat box, but I'll throw this to, to Jerry, to, to Jerome. Um, this, is, this is a question from, from Dr. Sally Fox. Anyway. Um, the question goes this way. What might this global network of universities supporting and enabling MP nodes look like? Sustainable, sustainability is always a key question, isn't it? Maybe I just wanted to hear it from, 
from um, okay. Jerry. What is his comment on this question? Well, we, we try to think of it not just as a network of universities. Uh, we use the term a trans institution. So the Millennium Project is an institution that cuts across other institutions. So we have some people from UN and UN agencies, uh, some from business, some from universities, of course, some from government, some from NGOs, uh, sometimes from, from media. So it's a mix, ideally, a mix of people, um, which has the advantage that when we do something, it has to make sense to the bottom line because business concern is there. But it has to make political sense because the government sensitivity is there. But it's also have to have the knowledge together because the universities are gonna be there. And if you have NGOs, then the NGOs have got certain values. The values are there. And if you have some UN relationship, I see you have UNDP here. That's good to keep that in there. <laughs> and, and because then you can have the international sensitivities as well. Now, the advantage of this is that your analysis and what you do will be almost by definition more holistic than it would have been otherwise. And it has the advantage that you can act through those different categories. All of these institutional categories have an advantage and a disadvantage, right? So uh, when you do things, let's say you want to, like, like, like Pru S was doing with the State of the Future Index, you can act through all these different categories once it's done. What, is, what does the government think about this? What does the academics think about this? What does the business think about this? So that so it's like an in-out sort of a thing. It, it's, it's, it's a trans institution uh, so that you're influenced by these different categories and you act through those categories. And that helps it to be more sustainable because different parts of it can help other parts of it. Whereas if all of your financial eggs are in one institutional category, you, you're, you're more vulnerable. And the last part is we tend not to recruit people. Doesn't mean I don't knock on people's doors, but we tend to have, have people find us. The advantage of, of, of attraction is that I don't have to push you to do some stuff. You wanted to do it. So if you have an organization or a node, it's a mix of trans institutional node, then that means you're with people that want to be there. So they can, their, their sustainability is partly their home institution, but then you can act collectively through the, those different institutional categories, which theoretically should make you more sustainable. Now, I would add one more thing on the, on the financial stuff, on the finan uh, sustainability. If you get the Asia thing together, You've got the Asia Development Bank. You've got all kinds of Asian things, all right? And a lot of these decision makers say, well, I, I want to fund something, but I want to make sure that there's somebody from Japan and somebody from Australia and someone in the Philippines. I mean, you know, well, as you put this together, it's easy to assemble such a team very quickly in the Millennium Project. Mm -hmm. our, our, our regional group in Europe called uh, FIN, the uh, Foresight European Network, with a, within a short period of time, they can put together a network of people for a proposal with the European Union or the European Commission. Um, we haven't quite done this yet with, with Reber, but, but we have opened up some relations with OAS on the science and technology stuff, so we'll see how that, that evolves. Um, but so that, well, that's, I'm rattling on now. <laughs> Oh, right. Thank you very much, um, Jerry, for that answer. May, may I call on Dean Lizan um, for maybe some questions or maybe some um, points to, to add on? Or yes. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Reggie. Uh, before we proceed and uh, before we get the response from the Philippine team represented by Dr. Alex, I would like to acknowledge the presence of Senator Wien Gachalian. Senator Wien, good morning. And we would like to uh, request you uh, to deliver your congratulatory message as uh, Jerome Glenn and our uh, MP nodes from Pakistan, Australia, and uh, Mexico have shared their country experiences. And now uh, I think uh, it's very inspirational for all of us now uh, uh, to really push through you know, with this uh, Millennium Project because this is not only for, uh, for, for, for our group, but this is really for the future 
generation. Senator Wynn, good morning. Good morning, uh, Dr. Lizan. It's good to see you again. Long time no see. I, actually, we just saw each other <laughs> last week. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I'm very impressed that even under the pandemic, you're so busy uh, organizing uh, several webinars, uh, even launching a very important uh, uh, project today. And before I give my congratulatory uh, uh, message, let me greet uh, some colleagues from the legislature. Let me greet Senator Pia Cayetano. Let me also greet Senator uh, Sunny Angara. I also saw Congresswoman Geraldine Roman, uh, who's with us uh, today. Uh, let me greet Dr. Jerome Glenn, I'm the CEO and co-founder of the uh, uh, Millennium Project. Let me greet Professor uh, Sherman Cruz. Uh, again, uh, Dr. Lizan, good morning to you. Dr. Tirso Ronquillo, um, one of the uh, uh, people that I work with also in the uh, Education uh, Committee. Uh, let me also greet uh, officers and the board members of the Philippine Futures Thinking Society. Uh, let me greet our very own Dr. Nedi Toralba of the Pamantasan ng Lunsod ng Valenzuela and Professor Mitch Will Rivera. Di pa ako sunay tawagin kang Professor Mitch. And let me also greet uh, Professor Alex Brillantes, a good friend of mine who's uh, here with us uh, this morning. Uh, again, good morning everyone. Um, Win Gatchelian here. During times of great crisis like the COVID pandemic, it is easy to forget about the future and worry about the here and now. However, it is precisely during chaotic and volatile times such as these when we need to keep an eye on how the rapid changes of today will impact our outlook for tomorrow. For example, the emergence of COVID-19 has accelerated and will continue to accelerate the di digitalization of every applicable aspect of our lives. And while the short-term implications of this seismic paradigm shift are already interesting, we should also be interested in how these fast-changing dynamics will impact our economy, our politics, and our day-to-day -day lives 10, 20, and even 30 years into the future or more. We in the Senate appreciate the importance of future thinking in fostering long-term economic growth and social progress in the Philippines. This is why we created the Senate Committee on Sustainable Development Goals, Innovations and Futures Thinking at the start of the 18th Congress last year. And it, and it is headed by one of our veteran senators, Senator Pia Cayetano. After all, the seeds of tomorrow's change are being planted as we speak. As early as now, we need to have a plan in place to ensure that these seeds will blossom for the benefit of future generation of Filipinos. Therefore, I would like to congratulate the Philippine Future Thinking Society, All Field Futures, for launching the Millennium Project Philippines. This is an important step forward in building a national culture of planning and foresight that will help the positive seeds of change to have planted blossom into, the, into their fullest glory many years down the road. My request to you as the champions of future thinking in the Philippines is to make future thinking more inclusive and relatable to the people. Expand your network to include not only the top universities, but also local universities and colleges in even the most remote places in the country. Communicate smartly and effectively so that you can mainstream your ideas and ways of thinking to reach all Juan and Juana de la Cruces. Only then, we truly, only then can we truly ignite the Filipino Hiraya. Once again, congratulations. Mabuhay ang Phil Futures at ang Millennium Project Philippines. Thank you.
Raya Manawari, Senator Wynne Gashalian, and thank you for really emphasizing uh, your support and the support of Senate. Of course, we have uh, Senator Pia, you, and Senator Angara, and the rest, of course, and in Congress, in the House of Representatives, we have uh, Congresswoman uh, Geraldine Roman. And we are very confident now that we have the support of the government sector, of the academe, uh, and the business sector as well, and the private organizations. So really, this is a collaboration of Filipino um, stakeholders wherein we will be able to design and, and create our future for the next generation. So, maraming salamat, Senator Win. Magandang umaga ulit. So now, I would like to uh, request Dr. Alex Brillantes for his uh, response and what will be our next steps um, towards this Millennium Project. Sir Alex? Okay, we are... Um, Looking for Dr. Yeah, there you go, Sir Alex. Yeah, but you, I, okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me now? Very Lisa? well, Sir Alex. Okay, thank you. Uh, this won't be long because I know that uh, our internet connections are not exactly the best at this point in time. But first and foremost, congratulations. I, I really learned so much and continue to learn so much I, from this. And thank you for inviting us. But the future wheel that uh, Dr. Jerome Glenn has uh, invented is really a very, very important tool for all of us, not only in the social sciences, in public administration, but all of us who are really thinking about what Lisan always talks about, the next generation. She talked about intergenerational equity, and that's very, very important because we're not here for ourselves, we're here for our children. I have two grandchildren, and sometimes I wonder what kind of a world I'm going to live we're going to leave them. So I think it's incumbent upon us. We are morally obliged, if you may, to provide uh, their, uh, take care of them. This will be brief, as I mentioned, but just three major points, uh, Dr. Lisan, uh, Dr. Jerome, and thank you to our colleagues from Pakistan, from uh, Mexico, and of course from Australia. First point, I think even as we, we launch this Millennium Project, it's very, very important that we build upon existing networks. This might be new, but it's not new. Point difference, as we move on, there are already some networks out there, including, as you all know, the Futuristic Society headed by uh, Secretary de Ocampo and our good friend Tony Kalau, uh, the futures thinking uh, aspect of the, our own various Philippine Society for Public Administration. Point is we work with them, and I'm very happy, Dr. Lizan, that your, our ideology here is really inclusiveness. We're working with them. As Tony Carlo mentioned, you know, the oldies are now working with you guys, the younger ones. And it's really so inspirational to see you guys uh, in the forefront of pushing the envelope of future thinking. Build upon uh, existing networks and equally important, build upon existing researches that are already being done. As you all know, we have this project with the SDGs. I'm sure uh, 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 Sir Jerome, Dr. Jerome is familiar with this. This is very much related, of course, to the SDGs. And the UN, we've been working with the UN uh, project office, not only in, in New York, but also in, in Korea, about how do we integrate the teaching of the SDGs into the curriculum? How do we integrate the teaching of SDGs into the curriculum? We can certainly expand this and use, how do we incorporate the 15 challenges that uh, of, uh, Dr., uh, of Dr. Uh, Glenn, as far as he's concerned, expanding it and really making it enriching it. So building upon existing networks, building upon existing researches. Number two, let's take advantage of the existing support. And, and I, this is, I'm, I'm getting this from the presentations of our colleagues. Take advantage of existing support. Of course, we have no less than our senators here, our Congressman Roman, and uh, there's also this initiative of the Department of Education headed by Secretary Briones about the need to set up a futures thinking unit in, in the Department of Education. And uh, Senator Cayetano has talked about a futures thinking unit in all agencies. So that also ties in with the presentation of uh, um, uh, Dr. Puresh uh, and then um, Anita as far as is concerned. Number three, and this is the last point, let's work with the SUCs. Well, this is really a theme that has come across throughout our discussion. You know what, we already have, I used to be with the Commission for Higher Education, and I'd like to uh, say hello to Commissioner Darilag, my, my colleague at Chad, whom I haven't met yet, but uh, we, we have, we, we, I moved on before he came in, but the Commission on Higher Education and other universities 
including PASOK headed by Dr. Ronquillo, MMSU uh, with uh, Nano Tangol, uh, PUP with Manuel Muhi. We have actually a network already of schools. I used to also be with the local government academy and we have what we call knowledge creation hubs. Knowledge creation hubs. So I think we can work with these hubs, working within what I said, the town and gown principle. I, I replied to Sally Fox's uh, uh, inquiry in the chat box that yes, let's work with them within the context of town and gown. Town and gown. The town works with the gown, we in the university. But equally important, bring in the local dimension. Bring in the local dimension. If the future state is at the global level, then we have the national level. Let's do it at the local level. And this is where perhaps a project on uh, futures thinking index at the local level can be done and done by the university within the context of the town and gown. So I thought those are just the three major points I, I take from this and really learning from all of, all, of, all of us. And I'd like to congratulate again DAP. I'd like to congratulate uh, our colleagues around the table. Sherman, thank you very much, Padre, for uh, really enriching us, linking us with uh, with, uh, with Jerome and our, our colleagues. And we look forward to really one plus one equals three. One plus one equals three, us adding value to each other, building upon harder gains and pushing the envelope, pushing the envelope, not for us, but for our children. So as we say, maraming salamat po. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lisan. Yes, thank you, Dr. Alex, for that response. No, again, the town and gown principle, and of course, we really uh, are looking forward to work with local government units. In fact, we have a number of local government units here. No, uh, I'll mention it later on. But uh, the Department of Interior and Local Government is represented by uh, Miss Pamela Carbonell right now, and we also have. Uh, uh, professional associations here, Association of uh, Respiratory Therapy. We have a number of uh, medical doctors are uh, present right now. And of course, uh, I would like also to acknowledge uh, Stephanie Pride, uh, our futurist from New Zealand, and also the committee of uh, the committee of um, Senator Pia Committee on SDGs, Innovation Features Thinking, represented by Attorney Kim Rances. At this point in time, I would like to recognize and acknowledge the presence of um, Congresswoman uh, Geraldine Roman. And um, ma'am, I would like to request also for your congratulatory message. Thank you very much, Dr. Lisan Perante Kalina. Uh, allow me first to greet uh, everyone here, beginning with our uh, esteemed uh, colleague in the upper house, Senator Winigat Chalian, of course, Senator Pia Cayetano, Senator Angara, as well as uh, Professor Sherman Cruz and the entire board of the Philippine Futures Thinking uh, Society. I'm also honored na makasama ngayong umaga to be with uh, our uh, resource uh, persons. Uh, magandang umaga sa ating lahat. Anyway, uh, admittedly, my interest in uh, futures thinking was rather limited in scope. As a lawmaker, I was more interested in social reforms, including LGBT, women's and farmers' rights, as well as health and education reforms. These reforms uh, were admittedly not new and already existing in developed countries. And my focus was more on how to narrow the gap between the rich and the poor rather than preparing for the future. To give you an example, when I authored the Philippine Online Library Act, which mandates the digitization of all the required reading material in uh, our school system, my main objective was to make education more accessible and less costly for the millions of students from underprivileged uh, Filipino families, rather than foreseeing a potential worldwide pandemic scenario and how it would affect the local school system. The idea started during my trip to the United States where I would uh, wonder at how the students were able to you know, read their ebooks in the metro, in, uh, at home, or during their holidays. And the idea of ebooks seemed at first very posh, I thought then, for the Philippine setting where there is a limited access to gadgets, but the digitization of uh, books was the first step in the right direction. Uh, the pandemic was never at the back of my mind because the truth is the pandemic has caught practically everyone off guard, except for a few enlightened people. And most of them are here with us today. I, I presume 
uh, that uh, well, practically everyone in government and as well as the private sector was unprepared. Everyone was in fact comfortable in the status quo and content with stopgap measures. But uh, world crises have a cruel way of forcing us out of our comfort zone. When faced with such a big challenge, we are left with no choice but to revamp and even to reboot the entire system. The education system, the health system, the agricultural sector, the economy, not only to remedy the damage done by this pandemic, but also to prepare the country for the new normal that has been imposed on, on us by the COVID-19 pandemic. This is how I view future thinking. Rather than just anticipating future problems and uh, coming up with solutions, it is also innovating and uh, using our imagination and making our country more competitive and have that competitive advantage to bring about economic progress that will enable social reforms and social justice, which is my top priority. Going back to the example of the Philippine Online Library Act, I'm glad to inform all of you here that uh, it is now part of a more integral and more comprehensive bill that encompasses all aspects of the new normal in our schools. It is part of what we call now the Philippine Public School of the Future in Technology Act, which uh, presents a very concrete plan on how to go about these reforms in our education system to adapt to the new normal. This is the positive byproduct of a global crisis uh, like the COVID-19 pandemic. It uh, forces us policymakers to think now and plan for the future. It is my hope that through this project, the MP project, I will be able to learn a more future-oriented approach to policy making so that the Philippines can be better can be better prepared and have that competitive edge. It is also my hope that uh, there would be more collaboration between the future civil society and our country's policy makers, not only at the national level, but also on the local level, even up to the barangay level. So congratulations to Dr. Rizan and your team and to the entire Futures Thinking Society. Maraming salamat. Thank you very much, Congresswoman uh, Geraldine Roman, for that uh, very inspiring initiatives no, at your uh, uh, district level. And of course, that will really pave the way to uh, helping no, uh, create our, our future for our children. And that's a very important point. And uh, from after hearing from the government side, we would like to hear now from our partners uh, from the United Nations Development Program, Ms. Uh, Yemi rask for uh, for a solidarity message. Hi, Yemi, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, all protocols duly observed uh, for all dignitaries. Uh, congratulations uh, to all. On behalf of the leadership of the United Nations Development Program, I would like to express our gratitude for the opportunity provided uh, to join you uh, in this historic day of launching the Millennium Project, uh, Philippines Nord. Uh, I'm very happy that there is a dynamic community promoting foresight strategic planning approaches in Philippines. As you may be aware, UNDP has established a global center for public service excellence in Singapore, uh, together in partnership with the Singapore government to prototype methods and tools for public service that has a potential to make a real difference in development. On the topic of today, which is foresight, um, we have been picking up uh, uh, as uh, picking it up as one of the four key ingredients to public service excellence. What we are really talking about in the future is in plural for us a capacity to envisage the various alternative futures to consider them select the preferred future and to pursue it without losing sight of opportunities and risks along the way. We chose the public services space for a good reason in promoting foresight thinking. 
This is because although strategic foresight has been around for a very long time, it has been on the periphery of governance, policy making and public administration practices until recently. For us in UNDP, strategic foresight is an organized systematic process in, uh, for engaging with uncertainty. In a strategic foresight, we seek to embrace rather than to control uncertainty. Why, one way of doing this is by, seeing, uh, by seeking out pockets of the future. As we speak now, countries across the world are battling the COVID-19 pandemic, which has presented governments and societies across the world with unprecedented challenge. Foresight is more important than ever in our, our, our current situation. COVID-19 has laid bare our structural weaknesses in governance, fragilities of infrastructure and vulnerabilities of households while highlighting the scale of change that is required to transition to more sustainable futures. This, compounded by strategic risks such as climate change and social division, threatens our fundamental, fundamentally to reverse progress in achieving the sustainable well, development goals. Uh, uh, we are still we are in a responding mood. Uh, we would like to renew our commitment uh, to working with a, a community of the future thinking in fostering uh, their post-2015 development agenda. UNDP in Philippines is building up a, a portfolio of support to promote uh, uh, foresight thinking uh, with its decades of experience. Uh, one of the most prominent projects that we are getting involved is the Next Gen Governance Initiative in the Pintech da uh, Lab uh, Data Warehouse. In this uh, uh, project that we have um, put forward, we'll, we would like to collaborate with the entire um, future thinking uh, community and we look forward for a very productive and effective partnership. Allow me to finally deliver uh, my congratulatory message to all uh, who's been involved in the launching of the Millennium Project and thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, yeah, for that. Uh, message uh, of uh, solidarity message and uh, you mentioned about uh, you're there no? to seek uh, to embrace uncertainty rather than controlling it and uh, that's very uh, participatory foresight that's why we have a number of uh, stakeholders inside this zoom room and uh, I would like Doug for his uh, solidarity message. Good morning, Dr. Algin. Okay, all right. I think uh, Dr. Algin is trying to connect again. And um, we would like to proceed to Dr. Ronquillo instead. No? Dr. Ronquillo is uh, also very, very supportive no, for all these undertakings. And Dr. Ronquillo is the president of Batanga State University and Philippine Association of State Universities and Colleges. Good morning, Dr. Tierso. Dr. Tierso, are you there? Uh, otherwise, I would like... Hello. Ah, okay, okay. And then I'll proceed to uh, Commissioner Darilag. Is Com Darilag already here? Uh, yeah, but he cannot um, unmute his microphone earlier. So okay. uh, you'll go first, Dr. Okay. Pierce. So to our dear senators who are with us today, Senator Wingate Chalian, Senator Pia Caetano, uh, I also saw uh, Congresswoman Geraldine Roman, uh, Prop Bruce, Chair of Millennium Project Philippines, uh, Dr. Liz, and of course, our partner, uh, Co-chair of Millennium Project Philippines, partners from Millennium Project from different nodes around the globe. Pom uh, Darila uh Dr. Alex Brillantes, uh, former Chad Commissioner and my boss at Batanga State University. Our dear partners, colleagues, good morning. First, I would like to congratulate uh, Millennium Project Philippines for this uh, mm. uh, for staging a uh, discourse like this. This is really important this time. So congratulations for your successful launch. Uh, we need to collaboratively do research, stage more discussion and discourse on achieving sustainable development goals towards a sustainable future. It's already laid out that there is sustainable development goals uh, in uh, support to Com Alex uh, remarks on SDGs. I think we in SUCs should really consider SDGs 
in our programs. Curriculum, research, and even community works, we need to align it with sustainable development goals for a sustainable future. The academy, particularly the state universities and colleges, commit ourselves to work together with the Millennium Project on all programs that will ensure sustainability of our future. According to Henry Ford, coming together is a beginning, keeping together is progress, working together is a success. We already came together. We already have our network. And I have seen that we kept our partnership together. I think we need to work together now to really make it successful. There's a lot of things that we have in our uh, university systems, in our state university that we can share with you. I think it's now high time to realign, to recast our program and really analyze if, it's, if this program will really support a sustainable future. We can even align our resources. That's now our challenge to realign our resources and programs to ensure that this is aligned with our partners in sustaining this uh, future. I also believe that uh, though we are talking about this in SUCs, I think even in basic education, it should be our youngsters, it should be our children to think of the future. They should be taught on how to consider the future before it's too late. So once again, I would like to uh, congratulate the Millennium Project Philippines and rest assured that we will be with you in achieving a more sustainable future. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you, Dr. Tier. So, um, as we move forward, of course, we will work with PASOK. No? I think uh, Dr. Aljin Darilag is now ready. Uh, Commissioner Aljin yes. Darilag, good morning. Hello, good morning. Uh, the Senator of the Republic of the Philippines and the Chair of the Senate Committee on Sustainable Development Goals, Future Thinking and Innovation, Honorable Pia Cayetano. The Chair of the Senate Committee on Basic Education, Arts and Culture, Senator Wynne Gachalian, First District Representative of Bataan and the member of, for the majority of the House Committee on Sustainable Development Goals, Honorable Geraldine Roman, the Philippine Department of Education Secretary and Professor Emeritus on Public Administration, Honorable Leonor Briones, the former Chair Commissioner, Dr. Alex Brillantes, CEO and co-founder of the Millennium Project, Dr. Jerome Glenn, the president of the Philippine Future Thinking Society, and the co-chair of the Millennium Project Philippines, Dr. Lizan Perante Kalina, vice president of Phil Futures, director of the Center for Engaged Foresight and the chair of the MP Philippine, Philippines Node, Professor Sherman Cruz, Chairperson of the Millennium Project, Pakistan, Mexico, and Australia nodes, namely Ms. Uh, Chod Harry, Dr. Concepcion Olavarieta, and Dr. Anita Kellener, President of both the Philippine Association of State Universities and Colleges and Batanga State University President, Dr. Tirso Ronquillo, and the President of the Association of Schools of Public Administration in the Philippines, and a professor of the Polytechnic University of the Philippines, Dr. Sanjay Claudio. Good morning to all of you. In the spirit of a forward-looking and future-centric Philippine higher education sector, please allow me to greet all of you the warmest salutations and well wishes. It is with utmost joy and humbling privilege to participate in this momentous occasion wherein we are gathered for the very noble purpose of future thinking, the development and prosperity of this country. As such, let me also personally express my gratitude to everyone for extending your invaluable expertise, resources, and time to invest and take part in this noteworthy endeavor in spite of the challenges and barriers of the current times. Truly, no other term can better encapsulate this spectacular feat than the word solidarity. With the Philippines becoming the 64th Millennium Project node of the Millennium Project and thus joining the ranks of countries like China, South Korea, Kuwait, and Turkey, its essential task now is to build a strong and reliable capacity for futures research in this nation. Furthermore, 
it will also have the objective to develop and publish the Philippines State of the Future Philippines Index, or commonly called as the National SOFI, which shall measure the changing state of this country's future. Following the definition provided by the Millennium Project, the MP Philippines Node shall become a self-organizing group of institutions and individuals that will facilitate the Millennium Project's research or conduct autonomous research in support to such. In this capacity, the MP Philippines Node will participate in the identification of incipient world's issues and opportunities, study their prospects and their potential resolution, as well as methods for accomplishing such research. Hence, in view of such paramount importance, and on behalf of the Philippine Commission on Higher Education, please accept my outpouring support to the establishment and hopeful flourishment of the MP Philippines Node. There is absolutely no doubt that the domestic fusion of futures thinking research is mutually connected to the realization of objectives and aspirations carried by the Philippine higher education sector. Through, through the Philippines' participation in the Millennium Project Node, the Philippine Commission on Higher Education can continue with its mandate to lead in the development of research for the betterment of the Filipino future. To inform all of you here today, the Commission has enshrined this principle in the CHED Memorandum Order No. 52, Series of 2016, entitled Pathways to Equity, Relevance, and Advancement of Research, innovation and extension in the Philippine higher education, in which the commission declares its affirmation of the value of collaborative and multidisciplinary approaches in research and encourage the establishment of a healthy ecosystem where faculty and students can examine the phenomenon beyond the parameters of their respective disciplines. On my end, with futures thinking as one of my focal advocacies in the commission, you can expect my sincere commitment to become the torch bearer of this young but growing academic field. And I shall do so by, this, by, begin, by beginning to inculcate the discourse on futures thinking in the deliberation and development of the new and comprehensive National Higher Education Research Agenda of the Philippines. Of course, this shall be accomplished through substantial consultations and other possible joint ventures that both the MP Philippines Node and the Commission may undertake. As I conclude this modest manifestation of solidarity, let us take a short break about the future and nibble a bit of memory from the past. I would like to share a simple yet insightful quote from the renowned civil rights leader an anti-colonialist icon, Mahatma Gandhi, and I quote, the future depends on what you do today. This is the very ethos of futures thinking, to illuminate the ways and means for us to anticipate the, the desirable future and prevent at all costs those we consider to be unwanted. Henceforth, may feel futures and the MP Philippines Node assist us in the Commission and the entire Philippine government to ensure that this country becomes what its forefathers envisioned it to be. Thank you once again for this opportunity. Cheers to a better future in this hope we are one. Thank you, Dr. Aldrin. Um, rest assured that we are here to really help no, the commission and, of course, the entire bureaucracy. And uh, what uh, you mentioned a while ago, the principle from, uh, uh, from that principle is really about uh, decolonization and indigenization of Philippine futures. That's why it's really based on our local context. And this morning, we are also honored that we are joined by the military and defense sector. Usually in our uh, 
a collaboration. We have uh, the academe, the LGU linkage, but at this point in time, we have the defense sector. And uh, to hear the solid solidarity message, may we uh, request uh, Major General uh, Angelito De Leon, the Assistant Secretary for uh, Plans and Programs, Department of National Defense. Good morning, ASEC De Leon. Good morning, and uh, thank you, Dr. Lizan. Uh, Secretary Delfin Lorenzana had wanted to join us today, but he has to attend to an equally important engagement. And he has tasked me to read his solidarity message. And I quote, Distinguished guests and participants, magandang umaga sa ating lahat. Inasmuch as we turn to history as our source of national strength and wisdom, we also depend on foresight to hurdle challenges that we may soon encounter. In fact, it is in being knowledgeable of the past that we become empowered to visualize the future. Our forefathers, such as Rizal and Bonifacio, relied on a vision of the future to fuel nationalist and heroic deeds. The same applies to our soldiers and civilian agencies in the defense sector who continue to carry out the demanding task of public service based on the prospect of a peaceful, stable, and prosperous Philippines. Nowadays, the COVID-19 pandemic made the urgency to be proactive and forward-looking, a crucial aspect of governance and policy formulation. It was hardly imaginable that we would suffer the wrath of a global health disaster of this magnitude in our lifetime. Certainly, the lessons and firsthand experience from this pandemic, as well as those from past challenges, will help shape our response framework, both in national and local government units, such that our decision making and preparation will become more strategic. Thus, we in the Department of National Defense believe that the Millennium Project Global Futures Research Capacity of the Philippine Futures Thinking Society is an initiative that is both timely and necessary. Phil Futures Project complements the institutional direction and sectoral goals of the DND, whose crucial role is to preempt and foresee security threats that may undermine national stability. At a time when security threats may appear in the conventional and non-conventional form, such as terrorism or biological hazards, the defense sector must be steps ahead in order to effectively address future problems. Phil Future's predictive methodologies may also help improve our approaches regarding disaster resiliency, relief operations, and rehabilitation efforts especially with the apparent consequences of global climate change and even our community support programs that ways and means by which we contribute to social healing, reconciliation, national unity, and nation building. On behalf of the One Defense team, I am honored to extend our utmost support and solidarity with Phil Futures, the Millennium Project global futures research capacity. Working on the premise that there cannot be development without peace and security, we are more eager to venture into collaborative patriotic projects that may forward the interest of the security sector and the Filipino people. Moreover, we fervently hope that the project may yield informative breakthroughs that may be beneficial to the Defense Department. May your project attract increased multidisciplinary engagement and public support so that it may provide various discourses and trajectories in resolving complex issues in the future. Finally, I wish to congratulate and thank the Philippine Futures Thinking Society for this empowering, exciting, 
a noble pursuit. Tungo sa isang mapayapa, ligtas, maunlad at matatag na kinabukasan ng bayan at ng bawat mamamayan. Mabuhay tayong lahat. End of quote. Thank you and God bless us all. Maraming salamat, Asik De Leon. We are one in this social healing as we collaborate uh, towards a global uh, future. And at this point in time, I would like to request also um, our, the representative from the Association of uh, Schools of Public Administration of the Philippines. We have with us uh, Attorney Arlene Lorello Casape. Vice President for Mindanao Association of Schools for Public Administration in the Philippines. Good morning, Attorney uh, Arlene. Good morning, Lizanne. At the outset, yes, uh, I'd like to express no, our uh, thank you for inviting us, Pop, no, to be one in this launching. I speak in behalf of our President, uh, Dr. Sanjay Claudio. Um, who I believe as an example, uh, as a very important engagement also. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, especially to the panel and the officers and organizers of this activity, greetings. In this time of pandemic, we saw how information was used to calibrate the response to COVID. We also witnessed the different stakeholders rally against this disaster. In the Philippines particularly, we are privy to the progression of institutional arrangements and adjustments the government did in managing the health crisis. For example, the latest move of assigning a cabinet member to an LGU for better coordination and quicker response after months of community quarantine. The Association of Schools of Public Administration in the Philippines is a network of more than 100 Philippine higher education institutions engaged in the instruction, research, extension, advocacy, and related initiatives in the field of public administration and governance and its subfields, including public policy, fiscal administration, local governance, and development administration. As such, it has spearheaded programs and projects geared towards raising the quality of public administration and governance education by improving the content and methodology of the discipline. As the premier professional association of schools, advancing excellence and innovation in public administration and governance education, ASPA promotes collaboration and co-creation of knowledge, innovation, and good practice among PA schools and networks and partners with PA and government stakeholders for sustained institutional and policy reforms. It is not only a network of higher education institutions, but over time, it has become a network of friends with diverse worldviews, collaborating in instruction, research, and engagement. The Millennium Project Philippines desired outcomes are closely aligned with, with ASPAPs. ASPAP therefore expresses its solidarity and support for their achievement towards a better Philippines and world. Congratulations for launching this MP project. Mabuhay tayong lahat. Thank you. Thank you, the Attorney Arlene. And uh, we are really overwhelmed by the uh, congratulatory and solidarity messages. And uh, before we uh, go to the closing part and to the uh, Toast. Uh, I would like to request Celine to play the VTR uh, of uh, Senator Angara for his congratulatory message. Sinj? Hi everyone. Congratulations on the launch of the Millennium Project. It's something very forward-looking and definitely in line with what uh, all developments for the future. Uh, we know that the future is online, is digital, it's changing jobs and industries, and of course, we can't afford to be left behind. Di dapat tayo maiwan. Ang hamon or the challenge here, as always, is to make sure it is inclusive, kasama po ang lahat. 
uh, especially those vulnerable in society. So, uh, kasama sa project natin, mag-isip tayo ng paraan para kasama po ang lahat dito sa maganda nating ginagawa. Congratulations on uh, keeping your eye on the future despite all the challenges of the present. God bless. Mabuhay. Thank you, Senator Angaya. Congratulations to all of us for this initiative and thank you for joining us. Before that, I would like to request uh, Professor Sharmoim to, uh, to have her, his wrap-up message and, of course, uh, to lead the toast. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lizan. Uh, the, 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 uh, the ideas and the insights that were shared today you know, give us some sort of a bigger picture, a brighter view, and a more vivid uh, possible possibilities about the future of the Millennium Project. And uh, of course, it's pretty impressive to see that uh, our MP chair from Pakistan, Mexico, and Australasia have uh, done a lot of things about the MP. And uh, we will take note of this suggestion, including those that were uh, mentioned on the chat box. And uh, of course, uh, the messages, uh, the good uh, salutations and congratulatory messages from our uh, networks in, in the Philippines and the world. And I also would like to thank, of course, you know, uh, Jerry uh, for his uh, support and for his wisdom and uh, for his mentorship you know, in giving us uh, ideas and insights on how to start uh, the Millennium Project in the Philippines. Uh, I remember a saying you know, that said, uh, it takes a village you know, to raise a child. And I believe the future that we are, have, that we, that we have at this moment that's front of us in front of us is actually the baby and the child that we should be we should uh, like take care of and uh, for this for the millennium project network this is the village that we have so it's very uh, inspiring and uh, you know a pretty engaging and provocative and uh, you know moving to see that from the start as we launched this initiative this is the village that we have as we try to navigate and explore possibilities, imagine those things that are unknown yet, and uh, develop you know, the initiative, the Millennium Project. But then, of course, uh, we also have to remember that this is just a launch, that the real work begins after the launch. And I always, we, are, we, are always this, uh, we have had always a lot of conversation with the Philippine Futures Thinking Society on how to navigate and uh, find ways and how we would uh, pursue this effort and it's always about the next steps and the actions that we're going to do after the launch. Uh, what we're going to do, uh, uh, what I have in mind right now is what we're going to do is that in order for us to keep this village, this network, is that of course you need to have some sort of a system to actually pursue this and we will be creating advisory boards. Of course we will need your help, you know, uh, your guidance and your uh, network, your support in ensuring that we, we, will act, we could you know, uh, pursue this effort. And other than that, we will establish partnerships with state universities and colleges, with the government, different uh, government agencies, and uh, facilitate uh, national foresight strategy research capacity. Of course, the first thing that we'll need, we need to do uh, uh, head on really is to uh, develop the futures research capacity of our state universities and colleges would like to be involved in this effort. And not only that, of course, as mentioned by Senator Ringara, we will be inclusive in our approach. And as uh, mentioned by Senator Wien, uh, it's not, it should not only be the top university that we should be, we, we, we should involve, but also, you know, uh, those universities uh, that are far flung and uh, who would be willing to partner with us. It's a long way to go. Uh, of course, Futures in Foresight is a long journey as uh, the Millennium Projects, Jerry have said, this is, an, is a Millennium effort. We, do, we will do this for today in, in the present, but of course, uh, really, the intention really is to uh, pursue this effort for uh, the sake of our future generations. Those who are born now and those who aren't born yet. So we will provide them uh, a voice in, in at the different levels of governance, not only in governance, but also, of course, in the corporate sector. There are a lot of things to do, and uh, we will certainly coordinate with you after this launch. And, uh, and it's just amazing to see that we have uh, the, the, this uh, with us today. And uh, just to close this, and uh, I would like everyone uh, for us to have a toast. 
uh, you know, as we celebrate the the uh, launching of the Millennium Project, uh, please join us uh, with a ceremonial toast. And uh, again, thank you very much and good luck to us. And uh, I wish the Millennium Project, this country and this planet to have a brighter and more vivid, colorful future. Maraming salamat po. Hiraya Manawari. Thank you very much. <laughs> Hiraya Manawari po sa ating lahat. Before we end, we would like to request Celine to take our group photo. Celine? All right. On my count, one, two, three. Raise your glasses and smile. There are about six pages, so it will take a while for Celine to do that. <laughs> All right. Okay, so we're done. Thank you very much, and we'll keep in touch. And of course, uh, before we really close <laughs> the Zoom room, I would like to greet uh, Jerome Glenn, a belated happy birthday. Happy, happy, happy birthday, Jerry. <laughs> yeah. Cheers to Jerry. Thank you very much. Happy birthday, Sherman. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're doing a great job. Cheers. Yes. Congratulations, Cheers. everyone. <laughs> Thank you. As I'm coming on, we will keep in touch. Dr. Lisa, yeah. congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Aldrin. Thank you. 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 Press. Hi, Dr. hello, bro. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Noel. Thank you, Dr. Aldin. Thank you. Dr. Tirso, we will do the ano, ha, uh, future thinking caravan in uh, in the universities. So Sige. we'll keep in touch with you regarding that one. Just inform us <laughs> and uh, we will join the caravan. Thank you. Thomas Green, hello. Hello, hello sir. Hello, sir Tirso. You are at the office? Nasa bahay. Okay. <laughs> Parang atin na yung office mo. Okay, so congratulations sa atin, sa inyo, sa future thinking. Good luck. Good luck. Come, Alex. Thank you. Come, Alex. Okay, Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Alex. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Alex. Bye. 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 I don't trust still. Yeah, come Alex. Always my eye. No time to see. Come Alex, come Alex, ang bat support. Well, mahal kita parito. See you guys.